Story Nine of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Nine Christmas and Rome. The first Christmas this, in which a Roman Senate has sat in Rome since the old fashioned Roman Senates went under or since they went up if we take the expressive language of our chicago friends and pius the ninth is celebrating christmas with an uncomfortable look backward and an uncomfortable look forward and an uncomfortable look all around it is a suggestive matter this italian parliament sitting in rome it suggests a good deal of history and a good deal of prophecy they say whoever they may be that somewhere in rome there is a range of portraits of popes running down from never so far back that only one niche was left in the architecture which received the portrait of pius the ninth and that then that place was full maybe it is so i did not see the row but i have heard the story a thousand times be it true be it false there are doubtless many other places where portraits of coming popes could be hung there is a little wall-room left in the city hall of new york there are also other palaces in which popes could live palaces are as plenty in america as are pullman cars but it is possible that there are no such palaces in rome so this particular christmas sets one careering back a little to look at that mysterious connection of rome with christianity which has held on so steadily since the first christmas got itself put on historical record by a roman census maker humanly speaking it was nothing more nor less than a roman census which makes the word bethlehem to be a sacred word over all the world to-day to any person who sees the humorous contrasts of history there is reason for a bit of a smile when he thinks of the way this census came into being and then remembers what came of it here was a consummate movement of augustus who would fain have the statistics of his empire such excellent things are statistics you can prove anything by statistics says mr canning except the truth so augustus orders his census and his census is taken this Quirinus or Quirinius, proconsul of syria was the first man who took it there says the bible much appointing of marshals and deputy marshals men good at counting and good at writing and good at collecting fees doubtless it was a great staff achievement of Quirinus and made much talk in its time and it is so well condensed at last and put into tables with indexes and averages as to be very creditable i will not doubt to the census bureau but alas as time rolls on things change so that this very Quirinus, who with all a proconsul's power took such pains to record for us the number of people there were in bethlehem and in judah would have been clean forgotten himself and his census too but that things turned bottom upward the meanest child born in bethlehem when this census business was going on happened to prove to be king of the world it happened that he overthrew the dynasty of caesar augustus and his temples and his empire it happened that everything which was then established tottered and fell as the star of this child arose and the child star did rise and now this publius sulpicius quirinus or quirinius a great man in his day for whom augustus asked for a triumph is rescued from complete forgetfulness because that baby happened to be born in syria when his census was going on i always liked to think that some day when augustus caesar was on a state visit to the temple of fortune some attentive clerk handed him down the roll which had just come in and said from syria your highness that he might have a chance to say something to the emperor that the emperor thanked him and in his courtly way opened the roll so as to seem interested 
that his eye caught the words Bethlehem, village near Jerusalem, and the figures which showed the number of the people, and of the children, and of all the infants there. Perhaps. No matter if not. Sixty years after, Augustus' successor Nero set fire to Rome in a drunken fit. The Temple of Fortune caught the flames, and our roll, with Bethlehem and the Count of Joseph's possessions, twisted and crackled like any common rag, turned to smoke and ashes, and was gone. That is what such statistics come to. Five hundred years after, the whole scene changed. The Church of Christ, which for hundreds of years worshipped underground in Rome, has found air and sunlight now. It is almost five hundred years after Paul enters Rome as a prisoner, after Nero burned Rome down, that a monk of St. Andrew, one of the more prominent monasteries of the city of Rome, walking through that great market-place of the city, which to this hour preserves most distinctly, perhaps, the memory of what Rome was, saw a party of fair-haired slaves for sale among the rest. He stops to ask where they come from, and of what nation they are, to be told they are Angli. Rather Angeli, says Gregory, rather angels. And with other sacred bon mots, he fixes the pretty boys and pretty girls in his memory. Nor are these familiar plays upon words to be spoken of as mere puns. Gregory was determined to attempt the conversion of the land from which these angels came. He started on the pilgrimage, which was then a dangerous one, but was recalled by the Pope of his day at the instance of his friends, who could not do without him. A few years more, and this monk is Bishop of Rome. True to the promise of the marketplace, he organizes the Christian mission which fulfills his prophecy. He sends Austin with his companions to the island of the fair-haired slave boys, and that new step in the civilization of that land comes, to which we owe it that we are met in this church, nay, that we live in this land this day. So far has the star of the baby of Bethlehem risen in a little more than five centuries. A Christian dominion has laid its foundations in the eternal city. And you and I, gentle reader, are what we are, and are where we are, because that monk of St. Andrew saw those angel boys that day in a Roman market-place. End of Story 9